Much has been made of baseball's culture war. New school versus old school, fun is fun versus unwritten rules, home run pimping versus keeping your head down and running the bases. But what about baseball's other culture war? As in literal war, in all caps. As in the hallmark stat of baseball's information revolution. As in the stat that, justified or not, has become synonymous with a fundamental shift in the way the game is played. A shift to crazy home run totals and strikeout rates to the slow death of the bunt, to wild defensive shifts, to the battle for baseball's soul. Yeah, what about war, as in wins above replacement? What exactly is that war good for? Is it worthy of all its attention, of its seismic impact that's changing the game at its most fundamental levels? Before I explain what the heck I'm talking about and get into a discussion of how Mike Trout and Albert Pujols' careers have been cheated somewhat by the stat, let's take a moment to understand what war is at least to understand the basics. War, as you know, stands for wins above replacement, and is meant to measure a player's overall quality by converting his combined value as a batter, fielder, and base runner into a number that equates to how many games that player's team won because he was on it. For example, Albert Pujols' 9.5 F War. The F, by the way, stands for fan graphs. There's also B War, which is baseball references formula, and Warp, which is baseball prospectuses. Each is similar, but a little bit different. And for this video, we're going to be working with the Fangraph version, unless I mention otherwise. We're also going to be talking exclusively about war for position players, though there is a pitcher's version as well. Anyhow, Albert Pujols' F1 in 2003 was 9.5, which indicates that, according to Fangraph's formula, the Cardinals won 9.5 more games in 2003 than they would have if, instead of Pujols, St. Louis had employed a quote-unquote replacement player at first base. What's a replacement player? Great question, but hold your horses, we'll get there. Just need to cover a bit more history. But before we do that, I just want to take a second to thank pristineauctions.com for sponsoring today's video. If you don't know about pristineauction.com, they're one of the most trusted sports memorabilia and collectibles auction sites on the internet. Prices start as low as just $1, with thousands of autographed items available, allowing you to win signed items at affordable prices. They have just about every player you could want, whether it be old school or new school, big market team or small. What's more, every item on pristineauction.com comes with a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators. Upgrade your collection of sports memorabilia today and get $10 off your first item one when you use code MTC. But that's not all. They've actually supplied me with a signed Jacob deGrom jersey to give away to a lucky viewer. Here's how to win. All you have to do is sign up on their website using my registration code MTC to be entered. Links are in the description and pinned comment. Again, use registration code MTC for $10 off your first purchase and for a chance to win the signed jersey. Now, back to the video. It's tough to date War's Origins to a specific date, because it's been around for, at least in concept, more than 30 years. And the formulas have been constantly tinkered with, usually in response to valid criticisms. The point is, War's nothing new, but only recently has emerged as one of the preeminent talent evaluation metrics employed by fans and general managers alike. This is because, while sabermetric stats like isolated power, fielding independent pitching, and Pythagorean winning percentage are fun, they're also incredibly nuanced, making them somewhat inaccessible to the layman. What separates war is that it doesn't just measure batting, fielding, or base running. It combines all three, as well as adjusting for ballpark, position, and league, resulting in one neat and tidy number that, in theory, can be used to compare players of different teams, eras, and positions. I say it accomplishes this in theory, because the reality is, well, war's got a few problems, and just as many critics, as the battle for baseball's soul is intensified between proponents of old school counting stats like home runs and RBIs, and champions of new school advanced metrics like FIP and isolated power, war has often been cited as the chief culprit for the league's evolving style of play. The reality is, war is more symptom than disease, neither fans, players, nor teams can be faulted for making use of the information at their disposal. I mean, come on. You saw Moneyball. Billy Bean's A's are not the bad guys here. The trouble is, because war is such a convenient one-size-fits-all stat, its value has been massively overblown, and its shortcomings, of which there are many, have been swept under the rug. When somebody does point out one of war's many flaws, there's always an armchair statistician in the comments section, eager to show off his bachelor's degree in arithmetic with an incomprehensible diatribe about data models, or the inherent limitations of comparative derivatives, or, you know, whatever else. But don't be fooled, while war does provide real information, and is useful in certain circumstances, when it comes to measuring a player's quality in any given season, it's questionable at best. When it comes to measuring a player's place in history, war is absolutely full of holes. For the likes of Albert Pujols and Mike Trout, 
all-time greats with immense legacies, war is even worse. Let me explain. Let's start with Pujols. We'd be hard-pressed to find another player who really exposes the shortcomings of the stat quite like Pujols. And, as it stands now, if future generations use war as the chief metric to evaluate Albert's career, he'll be shortchanged when it comes to his historic perception. By his career home run total alone, 703, fourth most in history, it's already beyond clear that Albert Pujols is an all-time great. However, his brilliance extends far, far beyond just those dingers. In 2001, Pujols' first Major League season, he won Rookie of the Year, Silver Slugger, made the All-Star team, and finished fourth in NL MVP voting. Across his first 10 years in the bigs, Pujols never finished a season with a batting average lower than 312, finished five seasons with a batting average over 330, and two above 350. He posted eight OBPs over 1,000, won three MVPs, and made nine of 10 All-Star teams, inexplicably missing out only in 2002, a year he finished second in MVP voting. But hold on, you're thinking, home runs, batting average, RBIs? That sounds awfully old-fashioned. I thought this was a video about war. It is. The reason I ran you through all those numbers is because they're numbers everyone understands, which means everyone understands just how incredible it is for a player to spend a decade averaging 41 homers, 123 RBIs, and a 331 batting average. Now, how about Pujols' war over the same period? Good. Very good, even. But not as good as Pujols deserved. From 2001 to 2010, he led MLB position players in war three times. Again, that's very good but not as good as it should be, particularly when we consider that over the same 10-year stretch, Pujols never had an off year, yet finished out of the top 5 in position player wars 4 times. Twice he finished out of the top 10. Not terrible, but nothing like the eye-popping statistical dominance that would indicate to future generations just how good Pujols really was. Was he a bad fielder, you ask? His defensive run saved over the same period was over 100, making him statistically one of the best first baseman baseball has ever seen. So, what happened? War happened. One of the stat's great benefits, again, if only in theory, is it adjusts for all sorts of variables. But if we're using war as a barometer of historical greatness, all that adjusting is one of its biggest flaws. See, because war adjusts based on league-wide production in any given year, if an offensive player happens to play at a time when the league is putting up unusually strong offensive numbers, that player's war will suffer. Why is this an issue for Albert Pujols? Well, because the 10 best years of Albert Pujols' career came between 2001 and 2010. Let's think, what else was going on in the MLB between 2001 and 2010? I'll give you a hint. It starts with an S and ends with a pteroid. See, even as Pujols, a non-cheater, was putting together a decade for the ages, his war was constantly suppressed by the insane numbers posted by the juice to the gills, came out of nowhere power hitters that ran rampant in the early 2000s, not to mention the juice to the gills power hitters who were already superstars before they even started roiding. I mean, if you look at the list of non-Pujols position players who led the league in war from 2001 to 2010, it's just silly. That list of top war position players goes, 2001, Barry Bonds. 2002, Barry Bonds again. 2003, Barry Bonds a third time. 2004, Ken Griffey Ju- Nope, just kidding. It was Barry again. 2005, Alex Rodriguez. 2007, Alex Rodriguez. And 2010, Josh Hamilton. This means, besides Hamilton, every single year of Pujols' prime, if Pujols didn't lead the league in war himself, the man who did was a known cheater. And that known cheater's offensive production combined with the offensive production of countless more known cheaters further down the list, systematically deflated Pujols' wars. What would his career have been like if he had cheated? We'll never know, but thanks to war, we'll also never know how exactly good he was during the years when others were. And that brings me to our next player, his former teammate, Mike Cutthroat Trout. Just to be clear, no one actually calls him that, but a Cutthroat Trout is a real fish, so, you know, it's never too late to start. Anyway, the reason Mike Trout is such a perfect counterpoint to Pujols for this war story is that, besides two future Hall of Famers who spent an awful lot of time wearing red and white, they have very little else in common. Whereas Pujols is the prototypical power-hitting first baseman slash DH, Trout is the prototypical five-tool center fielder, a modern Mickey Mantle who, unlike Pujols, or at least to a much lesser extent, has not had his war deflated by playing in an age of steroid users. What's more, Trout is considered the golden boy of the war era, a phenom on both sides of the ball, not to mention the base paths, whose talents should be perfectly epitomized by war's all-encompassing nature. Yet, somehow, the stat manages not to do Trout the justice he deserves either. To understand what I mean, we're going to need to push a bit deeper into the fog of what war actually is. By now we understand the stat is meant to combine a player's value as a batter, fielder, and base runner. 
but we haven't learned how. To calculate a player's war for a particular season, three numbers are combined, which are that player's respective run values across the three aforementioned categories. Once these are added up, adjustments are made for position, ballpark, and league. For example, Todd Helton would have had points subtracted for playing at Coors Field, or Aaron Judge for playing in Yankee Stadium. A player who plays a position like first base, which has an above average offensive output, will have points subtracted from his war, whereas a catcher would have points added. The same is true for the league. If AL pitchers happen to perform really well in, for example, 2014, an AL position player's 2014 war would have points added to compensate, or points subtracted if AL pitchers were unusually bad. Once the calculations are done, the resulting number is a player's RAA, or runs above average. That number is then divided by runs per win, which is generally about 11. So, just for the sake of the example, a player who finished a season with an RAA of 55 would typically have a war of around 11. Sound complicated? That's because it is. Actually, it's way more complicated than all that, due in large part to the different formulas employed by fan graphs, baseball reference, etc. But you get the gist. I'll add that this would be the moment for those armchair statisticians to let me know how wrong I am. Don't hold back, you know where the comment section's at. Okay, last thing about war calculations, then back to Trout. While it may seem that the process of calculating war is so complicated that it must account for everything, that's not even close to the case. One of the primary and most deserved criticisms of war is that it kills millions of people, upsets the global order, leads to famine, disease, and... Oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry, I uh, got my wars mixed up. One of the primary and most deserved criticisms of wins above replacement is the stat relies on an enormous amount of assumptions, while simultaneously failing to take into account an enormous amount of important to take into account variables. An obvious example is division. While war does adjust for league, it does not adjust for division, and given that, Historically, teams play almost half their total games against the four teams in their division, and given that some divisions have a lot of good pitchers, and others don't, it's probably obvious why that creates a number of issues. And less obvious example is defensive positioning. As analytics have taken baseball by storm, the frequency with which players are pulled out of position to defend a particular batter has skyrocketed. While virtually every team partakes, some, of course, do it better than others. This means that a third baseman who plays for a team that's really good at knowing when to put on a shift will often find himself making plays in shallow right field, making it seem, at least to the computer crunching numbers, like that third baseman is a literal superhero, making plays 100 feet beyond the range of his contemporaries. This would increase that player's defensive run stat, and by extension, artificially elevate his war. I'll qualify that some war models have adjusted to compensate for this specific issue, or at least to try. But given the speed at which the game evolves, I'm sure you see that similar issues in this category are a constant problem. Alright, enough of that, at least for the moment. Let's talk about Cutthroat Trout again. As with Pools, the first decade of Mike Trout's career was absolutely incredible. Well, almost the first decade. Trout dealt with injuries in years 9 and 10, so we're going to focus on the healthier first 8 seasons. In 2012 as a rookie, Mike Trout batted 326, stole 49 bases, hit 30 home runs, and posted a staggering 10.2 defensive runs above replacement. Despite missing 23 games, Trout's 10.1 overall war was still tops in the majors, including pitchers. Trout also, by the by, lost the 2012 AL MVP to Triple Crown winner Miguel Cabrera, which remains amongst the most controversial MVPs in recent memory. Returning to Trout, the next seven seasons were more the same. From 2013 to 2019, Trout racked up all the incredible counting stats you'd expect, in addition to leading the league in war five times. According to statisticians at 538, he already ranks 94th in career war, ahead of such Hall of Famers as Yogi Berra, Andre Dawson, Willie Stargell, and Mike Piazza, all before he's even turned 27. When comparing output to age, this eight-year stretch of brilliance places Trout, who debuted at just 20 years old, on the best offensive trajectory of any player in MLB history, just ahead of Mickey Mantle. Now I know what you're thinking, isn't this a video about war robbing Pujols and Trout of some of their luster? And if so, how can you make that argument and also tell us Trout perennially leads the league in war? First, great question, almost like I wrote it. Second, I can make that argument because even though Trout's wars have been great, they're still worse than they would have been if he'd played in a previous generation. Which brings us to the number one problem with war, the big one that encapsulates all of the little problems. War will always revolve around the mythical, ever-changing, impossible to define because he doesn't exist replacement player. See, almost all the smaller metrics that are combined to create war boil down to the question of how a player compares to this hypothetical replacement. Does he hit better, feel better, run better? However, due to all the issues we've covered already, it's impossible to know how a replacement player would actually perform. 
Replacement players are generally defined as minor leaguers, or MLB bench players available at low cost. But if we return to the defensive positioning scenario, it's clearly impossible to know whether a defender is saving more runs than his replacement, if the reason he's saving those runs to begin with is he plays on a team with great defensive scouting. And it gets worse, much worse, when we move into a discussion of legacy. While there have always been outlying stars in the MLB, the quality of the average player, which we can consider to be the league's baseline, has increased dramatically over time, shrinking the gap between top performers and their replacements. In a time with an ever-evolving player usage, where bench players and relievers have more utility now than ever before, war stands out as, ironically, somewhat old-fashioned. Previous generations will always have higher wars, at least on average due to this evolution, and future wars will continue to get lower correspondingly. You may be skeptical, but a cursory glance at the numbers will show you what I mean. According to Baseball Reference, we're switching from fan graphs because they don't make this information as easily available. According to Baseball Reference, of the top 33 single season wars ever recorded by position players, a shocking 28 occurred before 1970. Of the five outlying seasons, three belonged to Barry Bonds one to Mookie Betts, and one to Cal Ripken Jr. Regarding Mookie, I don't have anything to say besides he's really, really good. And of course, we understand why Barry's on the list. The case of Cal Ripken Jr., however, is much more relevant. While we're currently spoiled by a generation of big-hitting shortstops, that wasn't always the case. In 1991, when Cal Ripken Jr. posted an 11.5 B-War, that's 12th best all time, the other players at his position were historically bad offensively. Essentially, it was Ripken Jr., Barry Larkin, and 28 other defensive specialists who barely bothered bringing a bat to the plate, evidenced by Ripken Jr.'s monstrous 114 offensive runs above average in 91. Don't get me wrong, Ripken Jr. did have a great season, but his stats are hardly that eye-popping, and certainly nothing like what you'd expect from the 12th best season ever recorded by a position player. Sticking with baseball reference, Mike Trout, the same Mike Trout who has played 12 professional seasons, Including, according to 538, the greatest start to a career of all time is a lowly 60th on the MLB's all-time war list. War is cumulative, so we can expect him to climb that list, but we cannot reasonably expect him to reach the top. Mike's current B-war is 81.7. Babe Ruth, a player who played his first game more than 100 years ago, is number one, with over 100 wins more than Trout at 183.1. What's more, Trout's war has dipped slightly in recent seasons, as his endurance, stolen bases, and defensive production have tailed off somewhat. If he can stay healthy, he'll probably break the top 15, becoming the first non-steroider to join that group who didn't play in the 1920s through the 1950s. We're almost done, but I do want to make a final point. This video is not intended to demonstrate that war is a meaningless metric. It's not. It does a decently good job comparing players of a particular season and it is the best single statistic available for measuring a player's overall production that's accessible to the average fan. The point I am trying to make is that we have to be realistic about war's limitations, and must be very, very cautious about using war to compare players from different eras. Babe Ruth really was much better than the players he played against, more so than Pujols or Trout. But does that mean that Babe Ruth was much better at baseball than Pujols or Trout? No, and it certainly doesn't mean he was twice as good as either of them, as current wars suggest. Also, let's not forget about the cutthroat trout thing. That's honestly a pretty badass nickname, and it serves to be shown at least a little love. Just me? Okay. Okay.